Hello and welcome to Imagine Belfast. I'm Alan Mabin and on this penultimate evening of the 2023 festival, uh, it's our festival of ideas and politics. What better way, what better company could we have to spend it than with Noam Chomsky, renowned linguist, philosopher, political activist and public intellectual and over the years a great friend to this festival. Noam, you're very welcome back to Imagine Festival. Thank you very much. Pleased to be with you. Um, I've been part of quite a few online conversations this week and one of the very common factors is that there have been stacks of books behind the people. Now tonight uh, you have plants rather than books but um, in the past you might have had a good bookcase there. Um, do you fear that in the world of screens and so on that words on paper are starting to become less common, maybe losing their value? Certainly, and there are good measures of it. So there have been studies, it's been going on for a long time. Uh, there have been studies of uh, books that are assigned to uh, young people in schools. Turns out that even 20, 30 years ago, uh, there was a tendency to assign to uh, high school students, 12th grade students that used books that used to be read in eighth grade. Uh, we get students coming into the university who don't know how to write an essay. They've never had that experience. Uh, part of this is the effect of the uh, so-called teaching to test movement of the last 20 years, uh, Bush, Obama, and so on. Part of it is just the decline in reading altogether. And it's getting worse. There was a study that just came out a couple of days ago of the, uh, what's, what's, I think it's called Generation Z, the people who were born after 1997, mm -hmm. high school and college students, asking where do they get their so-called information. Almost none look at the newspapers. Almost none look at television. They've even stopped looking at Facebook too old-fashioned. They're getting their news from channels where kids are having fun dancing around. Of course, that's having an effect. The uh, uh, social media have other effects. They're tending to drive people into uh, self-reinforcing bubbles. We're all subject to that. I am too. When I pick up you know, start looking at things in the morning. I don't look at Breitbart. Uh, I look at uh, maybe Democracy Now! or something like that. And conversely, well, the media, with all their limitations, have a certain amount of uh, range of discussion and debate, limited, but some, not the self-reinforcing bubbles. And self-reinforcing is the crucial part. It means you don't get anything but enhancing your own beliefs and prejudices. And of course, reading is declining along with it. When it comes to um, when you're working as an academic, um, there will be fewer of the journals that are available on paper. More of them are kind of online, fewer books available on paper. Are you missing... Um, kind of paper-based things, do you soak in as much information when you're reading on a screen or have, have have you got used to it? Well, there are plenty of fine books available, but the question is, do people access them? Mm. If there's plenty of inf important information available on the screen. For example, you can I can, sitting in the United States, I can read the foreign press. You learn a lot from it. How many people do that? Virtually nobody. It's uh, surprising if they even read the national press, let alone uh, the foreign press. You learn a lot. So recently uh, I learned about a pretty incredible scandal, which is not reported here. Uh, this is called whataboutism. If you pardon it, yep. I'll talk about the real world. I'm not allowed to talk about that. So take the invasion of Iraq. 
were enormous atrocities. Some of the worst, most outlandish, outrageous atrocities were the destruction of Fallujah. Recently, the a couple months ago, the U.S. Navy just commissioned its latest assault vessel. It's called the USS Fallujah in commemoration of one of the most atrocious atrocities of this, of the worst crime of the 20th century. I didn't learn about it here. I learned about it in Al Jazeera, where I could also read the reaction of the Iraqis to it, naturally outraged. Uh, well, you don't, that information is available in principle, in principle, but you have to be motivated, stimulated, educated enough to understand that you have to look at things that are available. Uh, that's very rare, unfortunately. And if the press and the media are still acting as mediators between all that information out there and people who are kind of tuning into either mass read or mass watch stuff, uh, does the media and the press have a do they need to do more to actually increase the range of stories that they tell? Or um, is social media enough that we c it's up to each of us to find out that information? Because not, not everybody is bothered to wake up in the morning and even listen to the news, never mind go and search it out. Well, I'll just talk about myself. First thing I do in the morning when I get up is read the New York Times and the Washington Post two national newspapers, two national newspapers. That's important. There used to be lots of newspapers. So there were local high quality newspapers. I lived in Boston most of my life. Boston Globe was a pretty substantial paper, had some of the best uh, reporting, but not only domestically, but also internationally. Had the best coverage in the country of the Central America Wars in the 1980s, actually. His editor was personal friend. Some of the reporters were. It's gone. Now it's wire services and local news. Same with all over the country. Detroit Free Press, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune. Uh, the newspapers have radically constricted what happened is that the business model could not survive the internet. The business model for the media is basically advertising. So as so the media are businesses that sell a product, you and me, uh, to other businesses. It's their central structure that collapsed with the shift of advertising to the internet. One major effect is radical reduction of the available information in the press. And it's had the same effect on the major press as well. They've constricted. It takes me much less time to read the New York Times today than it did 30 or 40 years ago because it's constrained, limited. Uh, well, all of these are serious effects of uh, basically the capitalist institutional structure which imposes a certain constraint on the nature of media. Could be changed by public media. Mm. Actually, they've declined too, but it's not an issue in the United States because we don't have them. That's no BBC, no uh, German national television. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is a difference between the United States and other state capitalist societies. The United States has a very powerful business class, class conscious, constantly fighting a savage class war. And this showed up with the media, showed up with radio in the 1920s, early 30s. There were attempts to, popular attempts, uh, popular groups, political groups, church groups, others to try to create national media, mm -hmm. public media that would respond to interests of the general population was defeated by a corporate and to turn it into private media. 
Same thing happened with television 20 years later. Uh, result, the United States is essentially no public media marginal. Uh, and even that is corporate funded. And so you, uh, you, that's lost. You have to find other means to try to get out of the institutional factors based on particular forms of savage capitalism, state capitalism, that are constraining the means uh, of information available. Now, they are there. You can go to the internet and find out quite a lot, like I just mentioned, but that's a special, uh, special for marginal part of the population, even among the educated classes, very few do it. Mm -hmm. um, while we're talking about the media, can we talk about Fox News? Can we talk about um, Dominion voting systems with their defamation case? Um, there nearly seems to be more written about Rupert Murdoch, who's going to get married again, uh, than there is written about the actual case and the arguments that are going on in court. Um, should we be surprised that actually that, certainly over on this side of the Atlantic, it's getting reported, but just a little. Um, it's not a big story, whereas it could have big implications for Fox News. It could have big implications for your next presidential election. I doubt that it'll have much of an effect. First of all, Fox News is not a news channel. It's an echo chamber for the far right. You're familiar with that in England. The Murdoch system is not interested in providing news to people. It's providing echo chambers for far right propaganda. So you don't turn, Fox News is kind of interesting. I look at it sometimes just to see how wild and extreme the far right can be. It's kind of amusing. Sometimes, I actually tell you the truth, they're a little more open in some respects than the major media. So for example, personal experience, uh, I've had uh, interviews and discussion on Fox News, not in the major media, that would be very, very rare screen. But uh, I suspect that this scandal, the court case, will blow over somehow and they'll have the same, much the same role in the coming uh, period of political confrontations. Do you still value, even if you don't see it as a news channel, do you still value it as part of the plurality of outlets telling the same stories in different ways? Is it still valuable to have it there? Well, I frankly don't see much value in having a pure propaganda channel. You live in Russia, yes, that's what you have, but I don't think we need it. What we need is to strengthen, expand the actual media system. So, for example, there were serious to find other ways of public support. There aren't technical means to do that. There are people actually working on it, like uh, Robert McChes Bob McChesney, who's a media scholar at the University of Illinois, and to try to reconstruct the uh, significant local media system, also the level of national media. But the main point is, the main goal is educating people to recognize that there are things you have to understand about the world, and you're not going to find them from a limited, uh, even a limited media system, certainly not from social media. Now, this goes back to questions about what's happening to the whole social order. Why aren't people getting together to look at these things? They used to. One reason is there used to be something called unions, labor unions. Labor unions were not just uh, ways of raising, raising wages. They were cultural 
educational institutions. At adult education was a core part of the union programs. Unions are places where people could get together, discuss, study, cultural events. Uh, uh, Reagan and Thatcher or their advisors were very sensible when they launched the neoliberal assault against the population. First move, destroy the unions. The one way that people have to have to protect and defend themselves. That was very effective. New Labour, Clinton, they gave their own support to it. Uh, now it's pretty much on the United States, almost gone. Uh, and the other modes of intercommunication among people, you get atomization, isolation, uh, easy prey to demagogues of the Trump variety to uh, fake news organizations like the Murdoch media and people that don't mean, don't have the means of self-defense that they had when they were organized, could interact with one another, uh, mutual support, solidarity, common goals, and so on. And it's very interesting to see how powerful the efforts are to destroy this just saw a remarkable case in England with the Corbyn phenomenon. Corbyn broke with this long-term policy pursued by the Tory government and the Blairite New Labour. What he did was a real crime, tried to create a Labour Party that would be a participatory party and would respond to the needs and concerns of working people and the poor. And it was very successful. 2017, they labor under his uh, uh, influence, won the biggest victory they'd had as far back as you can imagine. The whole establishment came down on him like a ton of bricks from the right wing over to the Guardian can't have this. We cannot have an authentic political party that will break with domination by a small elite committed to the rich and power. And it came, you know what happened, it came with charges of total fakery about anti-Semitism. Uh, it was all exposed. You could read the extensive exposure in Al Jazeera again. But even the Labour Party's own commission looking into it exposed it as a fraud. No effect. No, this is too important. We cannot allow a development like that. That will lead, might lead to a functioning democratic society. We don't want that. This is a society which must be in the hands of the rich and the powerful who uh, are fighting a constant class war. No break from that. It was very striking. Something similar happened in the United States, less extreme, with the Democratic Party, Clintonite Party, moving along with the media to try to crush the Sanders phenomenon. It wasn't as extreme as in England, uh, but it had the effect of uh, pretty much marginalizing the popular forces. I suspect there are those though, who are members of the Labour Party in the UK who would dispute um, <coughs> your conclusion. Um, but um, it, it does point to a difficulty when a party wants to change quickly, when it wants to either go back to old values or new values. Um, that seems a very difficult thing for them to achieve. Is that going to be difficult for the Republican Party to achieve if it wants not to have Trump, or if the Democrats want to reinvent, they don't seem terribly sure what their ideology is at the moment. There's certainly in terms of their policies, um, they're not selling them well, you know, so. I don't think that's the issue. It's very easy for a party to change. Let's take the Republican Party in the United States. Uh, 2008 
the Republican candidate for president was John McCain. Uh, the most important issue in human affairs is uh, the environmental crisis, which is going to destroy organized human life on Earth. That's the most important issue in history. Well, 2008, the Republican Party did begin to move towards a small, limited climate program. Not much, but something. McCain had a climate uh, uh, was part of it, a plat was part of this platform. Congressional Republicans were looking into things. The Koch brothers energy conglomerate, huge conglomerate, which had been working for years to try to ensure that there was no interference with their campaign to destroy organized human life on Earth. When they, as soon as the Republican Party began to shift, immediately they launched an enormous juggernaut, intimidation, bribery, threats, massive lobbying, lobbying, astroturf, or astroturf organizations. The Republican Party turned on a dime. They all turned total denialism. So it's very easy to change a party's direction if you have massive capital uh, working for savage class wars, plenty of other cases. So the issue is not uh, the difficulty of changing. The problem was the kind of change that Corbyn was trying to bring about, a change to a labor party that would be a participatory party and concerned with the needs of its constituents. And even worse than that was their success. Couldn't be tolerated. Yes, there are people in Keir Starmer's party who will object to what I'm saying, but I'm afraid it's the truth. When it comes to the next presidential election on your side of the Atlantic, um, can America cope with another four years of Trump or another four years of Biden? Well, the Republican Party is, it really shouldn't be called a party anymore. Uh, I'd prefer the terms used by the political analysts of the conservative American Enterprise Institute who refer to it as a radical insurgency. Uh, that has abandoned parliamentary politics. That's pretty accurate. If you look at the international rankings of attitudes and so on, the Republican Party, if you want to call it that, ranks alongside the far-right parties in Europe with uh, neo-fascist origins. And they've totally abandoned parliamentary politics. All you have to do is look at their programs. It's not even a joke. Uh, program is block anything, anything that might harm profit and power of the very rich in the corporate sector. But right at the moment, sometimes it's almost comical, right at the moment, now that they've taken over the House, lead program, prevent the Internal Revenue Service from checking tax cheats. That's their main program. Who are the tax cheats? working people who file their income tax, you know, rich and powerful who have a battery of corporate lawyers who figure out a way not to pay taxes. So top program, prevent the internet and turn the IRS from investigating them. Uh, take a look at Trump's legislative programs. One achievement, a massive tax cut for the very rich in the corporate sector stabbing everyone else in the back. Lead uh, uh, top issue for the Republican Party is don't touch the tax cut, okay? Uh, the Biden administration came in with a moderately decent, not enough, but some kind of climate program, actually a pretty significant advance over earlier ones, which is not saying much, cut back point by point, step by step, by 100% Republican opposition 
Not a single Republican would break ranks to say, let's do something about a climate problem, which they know perfectly well is going to destroy uh, human civilization. Well, that's not a political party. Why? Um, you mentioned earlier in terms of social media and the bubbles and um, that, that we kind of naturally end up in hearing more of what we already believe. Why can that not be weaponized by those who want change? Because um, you could argue either with unions and um, that there are ways of people online finding kindred spirit, lobbying, kind of building up power. Um, or you could say in terms of challenging political parties around climate change. Why are those tools that are free and available not being weaponized by those who want to actually challenge those with power, those with corporate interests? Um, why is there not a grassroots revolution? What, what stops that? Well, it's, uh, it's not so easy to form a grassroots movement. You're against concentrated private power, state and private power. When you try to do it, take a look at what happened to Corbyn. Take a look at what happened to the Republican Party when it started to veer slightly towards environment. Take a look at what's happened to the labor movement. Uh, not for, in fact, you can ask yourself another question. Uh, take a look at what happened. Take the United States, which is the leading, uh, in the lead in the neoliberal assault against the world, against the population. Well, there's measures of what's happened. The Rand Corporation, very respectable uh, quasi-governmental research corporation, uh, did a study of the uh, general economic effects of the neoliberal period. Uh, for 40, over 40 years, they found, they studied what they called politely transfer of wealth, highway robbery to be more exact, transfer of wealth from the working class and the, and the middle class, lower 90% of the population, transfer to the top 1%. $50 trillion in 40 years. That's very effective class war. Well, you have concentrated economic power on one side, largely controlling the state. You have general population on the other side. When there are efforts to make some moves, concentrated power comes down on them very hard of the unions, Corbyn efforts, Sanders efforts, climate. You can fight against it. And over the, you look over the centuries, there's been many uh, victories. Uh, we don't have slavery. Uh, we don't have mm -hmm. a, a few laws. Uh, there are victories, but they're hard to win. And you have to recall, remember that those with Go back to Adam Smith at the beginning of the early days of the capitalist industrial revolution. He was an astute observer. He pointed out that in all ages, the masters of mankind pursue their vile maxim, all for ourselves, nothing for anyone else. Well, that was in the early stages. Now it's much more organized, controlled, and so on, but the vile maxim still prevails. And you can see its consequences. You can fight against it. There have been victories, lots of victories, even in recent years, but it's a struggle. And you're not gonna win unless you recognize what the nature of the struggle is. Um, another threat might be kind of cyber war. Um, to, we've kind of mentioned a few threats in, in the last few minutes. One of the speakers at the festival yesterday talked about the possibility that China might try and invade Taiwan. He suggested that militarily that could probably be defended, but the consequence would be that China might unleash a cyber war on the West that we couldn't defend against. Um, does that does that kind of technological war worry you? Is that on your list of things that are kind of 
challenging uh, humanity, um, along with kind of nuclear power and climate change and ordinary war and so on? Well, we have to bear in mind that the world's major propaganda system in the United States, which also has an enormous effect on Britain, largely a satellite of the United States by now. Uh, one of its main themes is you have to hate China, critical, yellow peril. So we have to be very worried about China invading Taiwan. Is there any sign of that? No, there's no sign of it. There, some would yeah. point to build up of military in the area, exercises that are going very close to airspace. Or military exercises largely in response to U.S. provocation. So when there is a policy called the One China Policy, it's been in place for 50 years, was settled in the 1970s. The policy is U.S. and China agree that Taiwan is part of China and both agree to what was called strategic ambiguity. We don't say it in words, but we agree that we will do nothing to uh, disrupt uh, this program by threats to uh, uh, challenging. Who's been challenging it? Over, China's not a saintly power. There's plenty you can criticize. But in reality, in this case, it's the U.S. that's been provoking it. Uh, the, you know, partly just militarily, the official U.S. policy is, quoting it, to encircle China with a ring of sentinel states with uh, advanced weapons, advanced precision weapons aimed at China, South Korea, Taiwan, not Taiwan, the marginal Japan, Guam, Australia, uh, all uh, surrounding China to, uh, con to encircle and constrain it. Uh, in the case of Taiwan, the U.S. has been cons regularly breaking the strategic ambiguity. So when House Speaker Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan, that was saying we're breaking the arrangements. China did respond, as you described, with naval maneuvers to indicate that it can, if it wants, blockade Taiwan. This has continued. Uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee passed the Taiwan Policy Act, which says that Taiwan has to be treated as a normal non-NATO ally with normal diplomatic relations, uh, uh, weapon systems, interoperability of weapons, and so on. Yes, China reacts by carrying out symbolic uh, actions uh, in the region around China. Those are not the only naval actions. There are others that you didn't mention, like RIMPAC, enormous naval operations run by the United States and its allies threatening China. But we don't talk about that. Since we own and run the world, what we do is fine. We have to worry about, we have to concentrate on people who are violating the rules we establish. Right now, the United States has openly, publicly declared a uh, economic war against China to try to prevent it from developing uh, the advanced technology that we need for the modern age. It's not a secret. You read about it in the London Financial Times, which describes it correctly as a war against China. Uh, China is reacting. How? By things like the initiative to bring Saudi Arabia and Iran together to overcome that conflict and to throw a wrench in U.S. policy of dominating the Middle East through an alliance of reactionary states called the Abraham Accord, including Saudi Arabia as a central, not a literal, but partner aimed at U.S enemy, Iran. Okay, China's disrupting that. 
uh, to blow to U.S. and Israel. So, yes, these things are happening in the world. But if we're within, inside the U.S. propaganda bubble, as Britain mostly is, then, of course, we have to hate China and talk about all the terrible things that China might be doing, but not talk about what we're doing, because that's quite proper and appropriate since we own the world. You have spoken out in the... Um, if we kind of move to Russia and Ukraine, you have spoken out and cautioned against uh, how people view NATO. You have, I, th I think, kind of reminded people uh, that they need to look at NATO uh, without kind of... Um, without looking through um, rose-tinted glasses. Uh, so they need to, need to kind of be careful how, they're, how they view Russia, but also careful how they view NATO. Um, and I think you've talked about the fact that kind of negotiation should be happening, that the US should be promoting a nego peace negotiations and so on. Do you see any evidence of that? And do you think a modern war could be ended through negotiation rather than having one winner and one loser? Right now, the positions of the opposing parties uh, are look irreconcilable on paper, but that's where diplomacy and negotiations enter. You see if you can make moves towards overcoming it, and there are proposals. Uh, an article in the current issue of Le Monde Diplomatique by two Finnish diplomats talks about means you could use. Well, right now, the United States has an official position and Britain, as a loyal satellite of the United States, simply repeats the position. The position is we must continue the war in order to severely weaken Russia. That's the official U.S. position. Basically, the U.S. imposed it on NATO. NATO, incidentally, is now a Pacific power, of course, the United States at the latest summit meeting determined that NATO must support the United States confrontation with China in the Pacific. But uh, U.S. position is perfectly explicit. No diplomacy until, uh, because we must severely weaken Russia. Now, if you look at it, the United States is getting a bargain. It's not a big secret discussed in Chatham House by U.S. commentators for a small portion of the U.S. colossal military budget. It's severely degrading the military forces of its own only military adversary. That's a bargain. The United States is getting another bargain. Uh, Putin's, in, Putin's invasion of Ukraine is, of course, criminal aggression major war crime, also an act of criminal stupidity from his point of view. It gave the United States its most welcome gift on a silver platter. Europe drove Europe into the pocket of the United States. It was an alternative accommodation between Europe and the East. Very natural. The continental Europe has a very effective industrial system, German-based industrial system, complex system. It's based very heavily on the net relations with their natural commercial partner to the east. Russia doesn't have much of an economy. It's about at the level of Mexico, but has enormous rich resources, uh, raw materials, not just oil, but and petroleum, but minerals and so on. It's a uh, path to the China market, enormous China market, in fact, the major EU market. Uh, one possibility for Putin was to accept efforts at accommodation, which were in fact presented regularly by, particularly by Emmanuel Macron and uh, telephone conversations up to a couple of days before the invasion. Not interesting wanted to drive Europe into the U.S. pocket. Well, for Europe, that's pretty serious. Europe, while the United States is gaining enormously from the war, not just financially in terms of military power, 
but even geopolitically, with Europe now subordinated to it, Europe is facing a serious problem. Economist magazine points out that Europe is facing a kind of deindustrialization, not just from its break from its commercial partners to the East, but even with regard to China. So part of the US war against China is to compel other countries, European countries, to break their relations with the China market. Pretty serious. Take a look at the Netherlands. Netherlands has the world's most advanced lithographic industry, which produces essential parts for uh, com computer chips, semiconductors, and so on. The United States is ordering them lose your main market, China. Will they agree? We don't know. Ordering Samsung in South Korea to do the same thing. You lose your main market because we don't want China to develop. Same in Japan. Will they accept it? Open question. Let's go back to Ukraine. Just look at logic for a moment. Either the war will be a stalemate and continue indefinitely, or it'll be settled. Can't argue about that. That's logic. Well, if it's a stalemate, Ukraine is going to suffer miserably. It's already being severely harmed. Uh, its military forces badly harmed. Economy severely harmed. Go on with the stalemate, it'll get much worse. The Russia will be harmed too, but you know, it's a much more substantial society. It'll probably survive it. That's if there's a stalemate. Alternative to a stalemate, one of two possibilities. Either one side capitulates or there's a negotiated settlement. Well, Russia is not going to capitulate. That's pretty clear. So the alternative is a negotiated settlement, diploma, diplomacy. Who's in favor of it? Who's against it? The United States and its British satellite are against it. We must continue the war to weaken Russia. In fact, that happened dramatically last March. There were negotiations in, in, uh, underway between Ukraine and Russia under Turkish auspices. Boris Johnson, who was then the prime minister, flew to Kiev and informed the Ukrainians that Britain and the United States don't think this is the time for negotiations. Uh, he was followed by U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Uh, the Western media don't cover this, not a proper topic for them, but apparently he gave his usual message of uh, no negotiations now, have to continue with the war. Well, the negotiations had crashed. We don't actually know the reasons. There's very little coverage, but that was probably part of it at least. Uh, but the U.S. and Britain persist in saying we must continue the war uh, to weaken Russia. Now, there is uh, an official version of this. It says we must continue the war so that Ukraine will be in a better negotiating position. Does that make sense? Ukraine's going to be in a worse negotiation position, suffering badly. So let's tell the truth. We have to fight the war, continue the war to weaken Russia, strengthen ourselves at the cost of everyone else, mainly Ukrainians. Well, how does the world react to this? The world says, we don't want it. Almost the entire world opposes this position. Check back at the Munich Strategic Conference a couple of weeks ago, international conference. The United States made every effort to try to bring the global south into support for the U.S campaign in, in Ukraine, nobody, not India, not Indonesia, not longtime U.S. allies like Colombia, Brazil, they all said no. 
this what they said is this is a proxy war between you and Russia. We don't want any part of it. We're certainly not going to pay attention to the bombast that comes out of the British and American media and propaganda system about fighting a noble war for democracy. We've had enough experience with you to know what that means, hundreds of years of experience. So keep your bombast and pretentiousness for yourselves. We're looking at the actual world. We don't want to be part of this. We would like to see a diplomatic settlement that'll end the horrors before they get worse. Uh, take continental Europe. There's a difference between elite opinion and public opinion. We have polls. These are free countries. Polls show strong support for negotiation and diplomacy. The educated classes, the media say, no, we have to go along with the U.S., British, uh, uh, no negotiations policy. That's the way the world is dividing up. Well, what does this mean for Ukraine? Just think through the logic again. Just plain logic. Russia's not going to capitulate. Ukraine is not going to get in a better negotiating position. Either there will be some kind of stalemate, which will be devastating for Ukraine, very dangerous in other respects, harms millions of people in the world because of the curtailing of grain and fertilizer exports, very significant threat of escalation to major war. So far, Russia has not emulated the U.S.-British war style of war. Uh, 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 President Biden, Janet Yellen, other officials have visited Kiev. Do you remember anybody who visited Baghdad when the U.S. and British, Britain were pounding it to dust? Remember anybody? No. In fact, the few peace volunteers who were there were ordered out of the country because the United States and Britain were smashing it up properly. That's a difference. Putin might move to expand the war to the U.S.-British style, go, go after the jugular, destroy communications, destroy energy, uh, destroy transportation, destroy everything that allows the country to function, go after Western Ukraine with a vengeance, uh, attack supply routes, presumably lead you in the confrontation with NATO. Then what happens? Now it's tanks. It's beginning with jet planes. Next will be a further escalation. Uh, the Ukrainians are the ones who'll suffer most, but the rest of the world is also facing the problem. Well, but make Ukrainians make their own decisions. What they decide, we should support. They have a right to defend themselves. But we have our own countries to care about. We are responsible for U.S., uh, British, uh, Irish, German policy. People of the countries are responsible for it. I'm in the United States. Should we support a policy that says, let's continue to fight the war no matter how devastating the effect in order to severely weaken Russia? No, I don't think so. I think we should stop the campaign to block negotiations and diplomacy. Can they succeed? You don't know unless they're tried. They don't try, of course they don't succeed. If there were to be a negotiated settlement or to be negotiations, could the result ever be just um, from a no. Ukrainian point of view? Is that is that a, no. is that just a moral? Diplomatic settlements. diplomatic settlements, almost by definition, are not just. A diplomatic settlement is one which all sides accept reluctantly because none of them get their maximal objectives, but they see that as the best of the possible outcomes, or at least the least worst of them. That's the nature of diplomatic settlements. 
Okay. So if you don't want that, okay, let's escalate to total destruction. Yeah. It's, um, um, we're, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, I'm going to come to a couple of questions from people who are watching in a minute, but maybe if we could look at, I suppose, the rise of the algorithm, the rise of um, those things. We've touched on it with social media, but we have um, news this week, I think, that uh, in France for the Paris Olympics, facial recognition will be allowed on a so-called temporary basis until the end of the Olympics, though what is temporary often becomes very permanent. Um, we've also got things like chat GPT, the kind of so-called artificial intelligence chatbot that can take your question and go off and give you a, a bit of an answer. What do you think about that kind of our reliance on machines to make decisions, kind of, if you like, taking the human out of the loop? Uh, is that a danger or is that just part of technology? It's part of just modernizing and um, every technology has its good sides and its bad sides. Does, do these things particularly worry you? For example, there's some of the crazier proposals are that uh, the systems of automatic warning of missile attacks should be automated. It's a death sentence. Uh, we've had 70 years of experience of uh, virtual uh, coming very close to terminal nuclear war because the systems that uh, are designed carefully, sophisticated way to determine if there's some, say, enemy missile attack uh, have failed and human intervention was necessary to prevent the end termination of human life on earth, okay? It's gonna get worse if you automate them further. Uh, what has saved us so far is human intervention. Uh, several, I don't have to go through the details, we're all time, but there were several cases that are well known where Russian officials just refused to accept the information that was coming in just didn't hand it on to the higher authorities. That's why we're alive. Hotlines are useful things for humans to talk to each other. It wasn't even the hotline. It was just a middle-level official saying, this can't be real. I'm not going to send it on. Mm. It was one case during the Cuban Missile Crisis when Russian submarines were under attack by U.S. destroyers. They thought they had lost contact with central authorities, thought a war was on. Commander decided we might as well launch our torpedoes, which happened to be nuclear tipped, uh, would have ended everything because of the reaction. One officer, Vasily uh, Arkhapov, decided to veto it. Okay, so we're now talking. Uh, there was a case when Defense Secretary William Perry was almost on the phone to call President Carter to tell him that the sophisticated U.S. warning systems had detected a Russian attack. He had now a couple minutes to respond. Well, he got a call from the central official, the monitoring official said, we made a computer error, hold it off. Uh, you want to go into that kind of system? Okay. But let's not have a look. First of all, we're very, it's, it's incredible. These are all human decisions. There's no technology forcing anything, nothing. And we have to remember that the propaganda and the hype about these systems vastly exceeds the reality. So you can read all sorts of excited uh, articles in the newspapers about a chatbot being a, uh, surpassing human intelligence, uh, another, uh, 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 you know, are they sentient and so on. This is total nonsense. This is basically high-tech plagiarism. Uh, you look into the nature of the systems. Mm -hmm. They're designed in such a way that in principle, they can tell you absolutely nothing about language, learning, 
uh, cognition and so on. They're doing something else. Um, nice toys, if you like. But uh, no constructive purpose that anyone can think of. But they are dangerous. There are already cases. There was an article in the Washington Post a couple of days about a couple of days ago about one case in which a uh, something like a chatbot system, which was uh, combined with uh, artificial image creation, which is not that difficult mm -hmm. these days, which was used for a major defamation project. Uh, well, we're going to see more and that, more and more of that. These are wonderful techniques for defamation, for disinformation, when bots get involved with powerful systems behind them, with like states, can be a major, can be a major uh, uh, danger. Mm -hmm. You should certainly be concerned about that. But uh, as far as uh, taking over, doing all kind of scary things, that's up to us, not them. Um I'll maybe um, deal with this quickly, but um, if a question comes in, you've mentioned Washington Post, the New York Times, your kind of morning routine uh, of kind of finding news from different places. Um, Al Jazeera, you've mentioned a few times. Um, a question in that says, you know, what are some of the important places that people might look for information that is that gives them a balance? Is it, I mean, should they be looking at Breitbart and um, and the Daily Mail um, and um, kind of Fox News as well as um, Kind of rep what you might see as more reputable, more impartial places, or should they stick to kind of a set of places? Is there a list you have in mind of places you enjoy finding out things? There's no such thing as impartial. I'm not impartial. You're not impartial. No. You should stand it. You should be honest. It says, here's my view of the world. Understand it. Interpret what I'm saying on the basis of my own in, uh, uh, perception of how the world works. That's what the newspapers should be doing, not saying I'm unbiased and neutral because they're not, nobody is. So let's be honest about what we are. That's, I try to be, you try to be. Uh, talk to an audience, I say, here's the way I view the world. You don't have to accept it. Just see if it makes sense or not to you. That's, uh, now if you look at the media, if I was in, I say London, if I went on, spend time in London, you know, first thing I do in the morning is pick up half a dozen major newspapers. Uh, the media environment is different from the United mm -hmm. States. You have to read half a dozen newspapers to get some degree of coverage, but you do. There's serious journalism there. Journalists themselves, especially correspondents on the ground, do excellent work, honest, courageous, you can learn a lot from them. So read the major media, if you're interested, read the, the business press, which is often very illuminating. Uh, their bias is on their face, so no problem. But uh, Financial Times, for example, very revealing material. Uh, and then look for things that are of particular interest to you. There's no algorithm for it. Uh, too much goes on in the world to know everything. So what you're interested in, you think are important, pursue it. But don't get caught up in self-reinforcing bubbles mm -hmm. and assume that what the major media are presenting is an accurate picture of the world. They're presenting it from a certain perspective, which is largely subordinate to powerful, to concentrated power in the private system and in the state system, which are closely related, of course, in state capital societies. So understand the nature of the institutions and take a careful look with a critical eye, yeah. recognize that there are fine journalists, trustworthy and so on. That's the way it can proceed. I'm going to paragraph, paraphrase one last question here from someone. Um, you speak a lot. You're very generous with your time to different groups and different audiences. Um, the danger of 
talking a lot is that there's a lot on record of what you've said. Do you often change your mind on topics and things that you once thought you had worked out and then think, you know, I've learned more, actually, it's a bit more nuanced than that? Or are, are there things that you, you do kind of swing around on over time? Sure. Learn things over time. You're human after yeah. all. <laughs> Yeah. You have a critical open mind, you're constantly criticizing yourself. Did I understand this correctly? Is there something I should look at? I should say that I'm pretty conservative in that respect. So my major conception of how the world works uh, hasn't changed much since I was 15 years old. Mm -hmm. you know? But uh, uh Actually, the first article I wrote back in 1939 was uh, a warning about uh, at a 10-year-old level. I don't suggest anybody read it. It was a warning about the spread of fascism in Europe, which looked ominous at the time and inexorable. Uh, still concerned about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think we're probably out of time. We've had an hour of your time this evening or this afternoon for you. Um, Noam Chomsky, you've been very generous with the festival over the years. Um, thank you so much for dropping in again this year to um, help us think about ideas and politics. Um, for those who are watching at home, if you're in and about Belfast, uh, tomorrow's the final day of the festival, uh, a few more events that you can kind of attend. If you're watching online, if you kind of click through to the YouTube channel for the festival, you can see some of the other events we had this year and certainly a back catalogue of things over previous years, including Noam Chomsky talking to William Crawley probably two years ago and maybe even a few years before that as well. But uh, to close, um, thank you very much, sir, for your time. Uh, Noam Chomsky, thank you and good night. Right.